Welcome to the sixth meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. Um, I may ask everyone to turn electrical devices to silent if you have not already. We've received apologies from Gordon MacDonald, uh, committee member, and Willie Coffey is here um, as his substitute this morning. Item one is a decision by the committee to take items four and five in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now, this morning we turn to our inquiry in into Scotland's construction and um, how that fits with Scotland's economy. And we have today Nicola Barclay, Chief Executive of Homes for Scotland, Shona Glenn, Head of Policy and Research for Land at the Scottish Land Commission, Craig McLaren, Director of Scotland and Ireland for the Royal Town Planning Institute, and Nicola Woodward, Senior Director, Litchfields UK. So welcome to all four of you this morning. Thank you for coming in. Um, if I could just start, uh, before we move to other committee members, with uh, a question about housing supply, which in Scotland, as you'll be aware, has not really kept up with demand. And what are the reasons for that? Who would like to um, <coughs> comment I'm first? Nicola. I'm quite happy to start with that. Um, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, I know that you're looking at the construction industry in this committee and it's really important to understand that house building is a quite distinct subset of the construction industry. It's got a very different business model. It's very much a retail um, industry, a retail um, business model as opposed to the rest of the construction industry. Um, why is housing land supply not kept up with demand? Well, pre-recession we built very similar numbers per capita as we did in England. Um, but since then, since the recession and since 2012, that figure has really split. And in England, we're now back to almost pre-recession levels, whereas in Scotland, we're only about 68% of where we were before the recession. The main difference is policy. Um, it's not legislation, it's policy, and it's planning policy. In England, they brought out the National Planning Performance Framework um, in 2012, and since then, we have had a huge amount of growth um, in the numbers. Um, we calculate that we have a shortfall of about 80,000 homes across Scotland now from pre-recession um, because of the shortfall every year is compounding, and so we need to do a lot about that. Uh, I think the main thing is it's the desire for more homes has to come from the top and it has to feed right the way through local authorities and through to local communities as well. We've seen that um, huge success in England with that method. Um, what are the implications for that? We have more home builders who are homegrown in Scotland now looking to invest more in England um, because they see that it's easier to build and get quicker and better returns on their investment. We've also seen that SMEs in Scotland have been unable to come back into the market. Um, you know, they were a huge, vibrant part of the market pre-recession. There are so many barriers now that they just can't come back in. And in England, you have organisations such as Homes England, who, you know, the kind of reimagined, reinvigorated Home and Communities Agency that is really invigorating and supporting home building for SMEs, for large-scale builders right across the board. And that's something that's missing here. Um, may I just ask, what are the, the what is the specific planning policy, or what's the specific planning policies and the the barriers, the specific barriers that you say exist in Scotland that do not exist in England to building of homes? It's the there's no carrot or stick in this in the Scottish planning system. Um, I keep referring to England because. It is our closest neighbour, and we are seeing huge growth there. Um, I wouldn't normally speak about England a lot, given that we're homes for Scotland, but there is such a stark contrast now. Um, the, the MPPF in England, and I'm sure Nicola Woodward will give us more detail on that, because she is uh, conversant south of the border as well. It just sets out a very clear direction of travel that councils must allocate sufficient sites which will come forward for homes. It's not enough just to have them allocated in a plan. They must be deliverable. And I think that's probably the key difference, Nicola. I don't know whether you... Well, perhaps you can ask Nicola if she can provide clarity to that. Or... 
So just to give you a bit of context, I am Senior Director at Litchfield, who are a national uh, planning consultancy, but prior to that I was Head of Planning Policy at Newcastle City Council. And um, when the policy changed in England, and it changed quite radically, um, via, you know, after localism, et cetera, et cetera, um, there were an awful lot more checks and balances put in place, which made the system more honest, perhaps, from both the public sector side and the private sector side. So there is a policy requirement to plan for your objectively assessed need for housing. So you need to identify how much is required. And in England, they failed in terms of having a, a standard methodology for that, which they've now put in place. So they didn't have the Honda, the housing needs and demand assessment that we have in Scotland. They've basically rectified that now. So each local authority uh, had to devise their own way of identifying and assessing what their housing need actually was. And that's for private sector and public sector. Um, they then had to plan for that. Now, the difference between Scotland and England in the current systems and why is it working better in England, I would suggest, is because um, at least a third of the plans that were put forward early, uh, early in the process in England were kicked back by the inspectors, reporters in Scotland, because they weren't planning sufficiently for their housing needs. So there was a really rigorous test of the sites that you were putting forward uh, for development and suggesting that they would meet your five-year housing land supply. That's not happening in Scotland and hasn't happened in Scotland. A number of plans have come through, I think it's four recently, where the housing numbers haven't been uh, enough, but the reporters have let the plans go through to be adopted um, with um, the promise of further guidance to come. That wouldn't, be ha that wouldn't happen in England. It hasn't happened in England. There has been some early reviews, but mostly the plans were kicked back and local authorities were told to go and look again and prove that the land that they had was developable and deliverable. Uh, delivery and viability tests are much stronger. So when you write your plan, you must test all your policies against uh, deliverability and viability. So you cannot have a policy in your plan that might render development unviable. So that's everything from urban design policies to electric charging points or requirements for developer contributions or the mix and type of housing that you might be talking about. It's every policy in the plan that needs to be tested. And all your sites that you're putting forward for your five-year land review similarly have to be tested. So if we adopted something similar with our housing land audits in Scotland, where there's a rigorous testing of your five-year land supply and you have to prove or, or as far as is humanly possible, because nothing is certain, that these sites will come forward They've got a willing developer on board. They've got a planning permission coming through the system. You know, there is a real chance that these are going to come forward. There's no constraints to them coming forward. Then you would see that a lot of the sites that are legacy, ancient sites, um, difficult sites, uh, in, that are contained in our housing land audits at the moment, would be parked, if you like. And yes, they might be good sites for planning reasons, but they couldn't form part of your five-year supply because you couldn't prove that they could come forward. So it was mu it's much more rigorous in that respect in England. The other thing that's much more rigorous, and it's been watered down a little bit since, uh, was the presumption in favour of sustainable development. Now, we have a presumption in Scotland. It's a little bit more weak in terms of its wording in the SPP. Um, but the carrot and the stick that Nicola talked about uh, in the English system is the carrot is new homes bonus. So local authorities, it's, it's in their interest to build houses because with uh, budgetary cuts, they can make up some of those cuts uh, in terms of a new homes bonus, which is paid for every house that's built in the local authority. And the stick is that their local plans will not get through the system if they don't plan properly and can prove that they're planned properly. And if you can't get your plan through properly, then it's basically open season in terms of planning applications because of the presumption in favour of sustainable development. So unless you plan for it, you're going to get it anyway. So you might as well plan for it property, properly. So there's a carrot and stick element there as well. So there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more strength, perhaps, in the policy, and it's um, implemented much more vigorously by the planning inspectorate in England in terms of the examination of plans. And is that just policy, or does it also have to do with the, the planning system as a whole? For example, the planning bill going through this parliament at the minute, does that uh, bear any relationship to 
or is it relevant to the issues that you've raised? A lot of these things could actually be dealt with within the current legislation, I would think. Um, Craig might be, have a better sort of handle on that. But most of these things are tweaks to our current system. A bit of strengthening in the wording of the SPP, perhaps, would, would give you the stronger presumption, would give you the necessity to plan for your five-year land supply, as opposed to there's, there's caveats in there at the moment that says you should plan for your five-year supply unless there's a good reason why you can't. And that gives a get-out-of-jail-free card to a certain extent. So wording like that could be strengthened within the, the system that we currently have. I think one of the things that the bill has tried to tackle is um, a perception of disillusionment with the planning system, a feeling that um, planning is done to people rather than with them, perhaps. Um, and I think, you know, perhaps one of the things that and by no means the English planning system is not perfect and there's a lot of things that go on that are absolute nonsense and you wouldn't touch them with a barge pole and you wouldn't wish them on anyone. However, one of the things that might um, be worth thinking about is an examination in public. So every local plan in England has an examination in public. It takes no longer than the examination process in Scotland. In fact, it's quicker and a bit more efficient. But what that means is the local authority um, defend the plan that they have written that has been adopted, the development industry, provide challenge to that, communities provide challenge to that, and it's in a forum like this, it's a round table discussion. So the communities who've raised grievances against the plan have their time to talk about it with the inspector that's inspecting the plan. Now, it may be that the inspector doesn't agree with them, but at least they've been able to put forward their views. And there is then a discussion and they can understand at the end of the day why perhaps some of their points weren't taken on board, but also why some of their points were taken on board. So we could move on to Craig McLaren and I, I wonder if there's something more to this, I mean is there land available in Scotland anyway? Can I give these a, issues were not addressed? Can I give a slightly addressed? different perspective? I actually don't think planning is the main issue. Um, I think if you look at um, the way in which we have um, planning, uh, sorry, housing uh, completions over the last uh, five years, it's about 17,500 a year, I think. Uh, if you look at the number of planning permissions we're given for housing over the last two years, in, in, two, in 2016 it was 37,000, um, and in 2017 there were 29,500. So I, I actually think planning, it's not perfect. I think we have, to, we have to fix bits of it, but it's not the key issue. For me, the key issue is getting from the planning permission to the actual sh the shovel on the ground. And there's been work done on that in England um, in the Lebanon Review, which has identified a number of key issues on that, which are things such as um, the lack of infrastructure, which makes a site viable, um, the, uh, the lack of utility companies joining things up to make sure that you've got the water, um, the electricity, the different things you need to build housing uh, is there as well. Issues with land remediation, because you can contaminate either vacant land, um, the logistics of the site, <laughs> also things such as limited capital to get things moving as well. So planning is part of Part of the issue, but it's also a big part of the problem. Um, but it's not the big problem in, in my mind. I, th I think one of the things we need to do with that is um, is try and reposition planning as being part of the solution, and we need to do things to make that happen. If I'm being honest, just now, planning is something which is often seen as a, a regulatory service, something which stops things happening. Um, as a profession and as the professional body for town planners, we're always very keen to try and make sure that we see planning as a facilitative and an enabling force, which actually gets people on board to see what they want in an area and to work out a route map to make that happen, uh, bearing in mind what the opportunities and constraints are for that particular area as well. So there's a bit about trying to make sure that the planning system and the planning profession is seen as something which is actually a corporate service within local government, just now it's seen as something which is sidelined in many ways. Um, you've got to try and make it something which is collaborative, worked with a range of different players, um, so we can actually deliver things. Because if I'm being truthful, what happens just now, planners plan, and most of the delivery comes from other organisations, so we need to join up that gap um, uh, much more better much more, uh, much better than we can just now. Um, and there's a bit about planning being something which is much more proactive. Just now it could tend to be quite reactive. It responds to developers coming with ideas. My, uh, through my age, but when, when I started off in planning, planning was much more about providing the vision for an area, bringing people together to think about what they wanted in their area, um, looking at what the opportunities were, looking at who could do what, who, who was responsible for delivering what, and then developing a route map and creating a dialogue throughout that process to deliver things as well. So we need to look at planning in a different way, and we need to fund it in a different way just now, because at the moment it's not being resourced. Um, the amount of money which goes into um, the planning service in terms of development plans and development management and local authorities is estimated to be 0.38% next year, which is a small, small amount for a service which actually can make a major difference. 
Do you mean 0.38% of the local authority budget? Yeah, the revenue budget. Um, can I just ask one thing? You touched on the question of infrastructure, and of course, if there might be a plan, there might be a, a development to be built, but if there's no infrastructure in place, obviously houses can't be built. I mean, is the lead-in time for provision of infrastructure for housing developments too long? In, ter in terms of getting the plan, having the the funding in place and then trying to get it I to think happen. The, the, the problem just now, I think, with infrastructure, it's all very ad hoc uh, and unplanned. Um, there mm -hmm. are different providers doing different things. There's an issue with coordination. Uh, if you look at things even at a national level, we've got a national planning framework uh, just now, um, which doesn't really talk to the infrastructure investment plan, um, which doesn't really talk to city region deals, which doesn't really talk to the um, uh, regional transport partnerships. There's a disconnect there, and I think there's a need to better join up how we plan our infrastructure, because you can use infrastructure in a very creative way. If you use infrastructure, you can actually open up sites for housing. You can make like, you can make them viable. You can make them attractive to people as well. So we need to think in that proactive and that creative way with infrastructure. There's an issue generally with the fact that there's not an awful lot of money around for infrastructure, uh, and there's a need to try and look at that. Because when I talk to developers, when I talk to councils. Um, Housing development comes in, um, and one of the first things it's asked is who, who's going to provide the school for this, because there's going to be school places created by this new housing development, and no one's got the money to actually cover it just now. So there's a need to try and see how we can break that logjam. Um, you can look at that in terms of, is there a role for Scottish Government in taking a much more proactive and stronger role in that, um, and think about how it can do that, or are there other mechanisms we can use to try and make sure that we can build that resource? Right. Um, I'd like to move on to other members of the committee. Shona Glenn, no doubt you'll come in on some of the, the questions, but um, if Jackie Bailey. Yeah, whilst I will agree with much of what Craig McLaren said, I'm going to return to planning with my questions um, and the housing land audit specifically. Um, it, Scottish Government did a piece of research looking across all local authorities, and they found, not surprisingly, weaknesses and inconsistencies, so they couldn't extrapolate a national picture. Um, can I get your views across the panel on HLAs and their importance for um, construction sector planning? Maybe I should start with Shona Glenn, seeing as she hasn't do spoken I, yet. Do I, do I need to press a button here? No, no sorry, I, I should have oh, said okay. the... Um, uh, by the sound desk. Okay. Um, well, the, the piece of research that you're talking about, um, I, I, I'm not familiar with the detail, um, but what I do know about it is um, it, 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 one of the messages that seems, com seems to be coming out of it is about the, the consistency of, of how, how housing land audits and, and other planning policies are used. And this is a theme that actually has emerged from a lot of the research that we've been doing um, around about land value capture um, and the, the need for clear and consistent planning policies and, and how actually if you have those very clear and consistent planning policies, that can be a really um, it can be very effective in helping to shape land values because what happens is um, developers or um, uh, house builders when they're, when they're buying land they, then take, they can then take account of those policies when they're deciding what to pay for land so if those policies are very clear and consistent um, they take, take those policies into account when they decide what to pay for land um, it helps to drive down land values and leaves more of the value in the system um, to pay for things like infrastructure so I, I can't comment, comment in the detail of the research but the, the principle of clear and consistent policies um, is one that we would, we would strongly support and has been borne out by the research that we've done in other areas Nicola Barclay Housing land audits could be one of the most important tools for the planning system. Um, and if they were used successfully, they would be able to measure this continuous five-year effective land supply for each local authority, which we could then work out nationally whether we had enough housing. Unfortunately, at the moment, and, and I must say that Homes for Scotland is one of the few organisations that has a site across pretty much the whole country in their housing land audits because most local authorities engage with us and our members to test the, the evidence that sits within their audits to see whether or not they are measuring the right sites, will they come forward in the timescale that they're suggesting. But there is um, great discrepancy across the whole country about how well this is um, carried out. Um, there's not one model, so every local authority has a different um, plan, or a different looking um, housing land audit. Some have different information in them. Uh, the definition of what is a constrained site is different in each. So there's a lot of work we could do, and I think work has begun already on that with, with the government review, which we really welcomed. Um, it's really important that they're used to, to capture well what the constraints are, and then see whether those can be overcome. 
And if they can, well, that's fantastic. But if they can't, don't assume that that site will come forward. It needs to be parked, as Nicola said earlier. And more importantly, you need to then find other land to substitute. So you're not doing that local community a disservice by not providing the houses that are needed. Can I perhaps move on to the Litchfield report and get you to, to comment on it? Because um, what you found, that particularly across the, the seven cities, that land was reappearing in every audit, that it was kind of rolled over, um, and it seemed that it, you know, multiple times and it seemed undeliverable. Um, I wonder whether you could expand a bit on, on what you found and what the solution is. OK, so we did this research um, a couple of years ago now. Um, so it was based on 2014-2015 land audits. Um, so just sort of caveat it slightly on that. But what we did was we looked at, we actually looked at, for Scottish Government, we looked at all the local authorities across Scotland, as well as the city, and we did a report on the cities as well. Um, and we looked at the market strength of where the housing land was identified. And we very simply categorised that into five categories, from the strongest to the weakest. Now, in discussions <coughs> with um, the house building industry, they are absolutely clear that they cannot bring forward sites in the two weakest bands. Mm. And there's a number of reasons for that. And um, incomes in the second weakest band, uh, household incomes are around 30k per annum. In the weakest band, around 15k per annum. Now, most people who uh, are living within those um, constraints cannot access mortgage finance. Um, the average house prices in those areas are similarly low as a result. So in the second weakest, it's maybe 110,000 um, for an average house price, and in the, the weakest, it's maybe 76. In this day and age, a house builder cannot build a house for less than that price. Therefore, it's not economically viable for them to bring forward those sites. So those sites and those market areas will not come forward without subsidy, without some other um, assistance. Now, that's not to say from a planning point of view that they're not good sites to bring forward housing on. It's just that the public sector, the PLCs, the house builders will not be able to bring them forward. So if you want them in your five-year housing land supply, then you need to find another mechanism to deliver them. Now, this is quite stark across um, a number of the local authorities. Um, when we did this research, in those two bands, those two weakest bands, Glasgow City had 77% of the yield, the, proper, the number of houses that were identified, 77% in 2014-15 were in those two weakest bands. So that suggests that 77% of your five-year housing land supply will not come forward through normal house building means. Uh, Inverclyde, 59%, North Lanarkshire, 57%, Renfrewshire, 59%, Western Barton, 43%, Dundee, 61%, the Air oh, East Ayrshire, 80%, North Ayrshire, 61%, Clickman, and 86%. So these are big, big percentages. In the other local authorities, Aberdeenshire were absolutely fine, not a problem. Highland weren't much of a problem either. Some of them sit at about a third. But that shows you there's a huge proportion of land that's been identified as deliverable within five years that really would, would require um, significant help to be able to be realised. But, but Hence the reason a lot roll forward, potentially. But in fairness, that's down to the demographics of the area, and you're not really going to change that unless perhaps you, you change the tenure mix of the housing that you're bringing forward. And there is an element of that, yes, absolutely, but there's also an element of allocating the land... Uh, in the right places in your district. If you have identified through your housing needs and demand assessment um, a demand for private sector housing, you need to be allocating the sites in the locations that can deliver that. You will also have identified a need for um, social sector housing, and those will be in potentially different market areas as well. So it, the whole picture has to be looked at. But if you're saying that you have a five-year housing land supply that is going to deliver that number of homes to meet your need and demand within that area, um, you need to be making sure that what you're promoting is deliverable. And that's not necessarily happening. And that won't happen without potentially you know, another intervention. In some areas like Glasgow, there is another intervention happening. City deal is being used to that effect, etc., etc. So it's not necessarily all doom and gloom. But you, your question was about rolling forward sites from one year to another. And that happens all over. Now, there are some sites that have been through two economic cycles. And if they didn't deliver in the peak of 2006-07, what, why, why there is still a notion that they will deliver in the next five years is, is difficult to, to reconcile. There is a slight watch in that, in that some sites 
take time to come through. But that needs to be understood when you're doing your housing land audit as well. If you've got a site of 500 houses, it's going to take two or three years to come through the system. So, but you need to build that in. So don't assume that that site is going to deliver on year one of your five-year housing land audit. Put it to the back end. And it's only going to deliver 30 units a year. It's not going to deliver your 500. So there is, needs to be more rigour in the housing land audits to make them really fit for purpose. Craig McLaren. Yeah, um, I agree with a lot of what's been said. Um, for me, I think HLAs are actually a really useful tool. Um, they could be even more useful. Um, there's, there's three things for me, and they've already been mentioned, but what, one's about consistency across uh, across Scotland and how we actually do it, so we can, we can measure in, uh, across those different areas. The, the second thing is that they are a bit static. Uh, they will give you details of location, size, the, the capacity, and the planning status, and things like that as well. But as, as Nicola said, that there's a bit for me about well, what happens next. It's about thinking, well, well, how does that impact on what your investment patterns look like? What does that, how does that impact on what your policy should be? Should we, should we try to do something different with that area as well? So moving away from that static tool, I think, would be really useful. Another key thing for me is, is they need to be a bit more transparent in how we actually uh, apply them. Uh, and that's from both sides, if I can use the term sides. Um, it's about trying to make sure that there's, there's a real uh, rigour brought in to see the buildability, if that's a word, um, of these uh, of, of the sites which are in there as well. And we have an honest uh, discussion, debate about that, so we know where we stand. OK, thank you, convener. Thank you. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming along this morning. Um, one of the criticisms that's often levelled at um, housing developers is the question of land banking. Um, I just wonder if anyone can define what that term is and um, take, take a view on whether, in fact, it's an issue or not. Can I respond? Yes, Thank you. I think you're right to ask, what does it mean? Because I think it means different things to different people. Um, we quite often will hear um, reports from the city saying that a, a PLC house builder has a land bank of X number of units. And then you hear criticism of house builders land banking. Now, to my mind, they're two very different things. Um, to have a land bank is to have a pipeline of your raw material that you need to run your business. And any business, um, regardless of what you're making, needs to know where your raw material is coming from. So you have to line that up um, over the next, say, three to five years in, in terms of house building industry. The other use of land banking is that idea that somebody's sitting on a piece of land, deliberately not bringing it to market, waiting for the price to rise. And I would say that the majority of house builders do not do that because they, they make their money by selling houses and getting a return on the investment that they've put in. It's not to say that some landowners don't do that, and, and some people will own land as an investment. They may have a planning consent on it, but they might have n absolutely no interest in bringing that to the market and putting houses on it. They hold it for a very different reason. And, and that is a problem. Um, but it's not one that house builders do because the house building model itself is all about returning your investment. The minute you've paid for your land, the only way to get your money back is to sell houses on it. So you do that um, to your business model, to your business plan. Um, you've got money from your investors. You've told them how quickly you're going to sell that site out, and that's what you do. So I think, I think the phrase land banking is confusing for people, and I often encourage our members to use the word pipeline rather than land banking, but I'm probably fighting a losing battle because it's one that's used by the city, and people know what they mean by that. Um, but I know, Mr Whiteman, you um, may consider land banking to be in a slightly different place. So, so, so just to be clear, <clears throat> in terms of housing developers, you would argue they have a, they have a pipeline, um, but they don't hold land banks for speculative purposes. But landowners do. So, I mean, there is a lot of land, I know in my region in Edinburgh, that's been sitting there for 10 years. Uh, some of it's owned in the British Virgin Islands, don't even know who owns it. No. Um, that is a land bank, it's sitting there. It's mm -hmm. had consents in the past. It's in the housing land supply. Uh, audit. Um, so that's a fair reflection of your position. I, I, yes, yeah. I think so. Uh, and land such as that down at uh, Leith Rocks, for example, is an example of a landowner who historically was considering selling that land and it did have master plan consent on it and there were developers lined up 
and developers did start building there. But changes in economic circumstances, change in ownership, even the, the landowner changed hands as far as I'm aware, and you no longer have the control as a house builder of getting your hands on that land. It's, it's not that common. It may be in your particular area, and it's a problem when it's brownfield land and it blights local communities. But when a house builder is looking for a site, they are looking to build houses on it. That's what they do. So um, that's fair enough. But where, where a, a company that um, or an, an owner owns land, that they, they may not wish to for, for, for whatever reason. Does that beg the question, therefore, that we need to explore new models. Um, Nicola, you were talking about new models of bringing forward what you were calling the weakest um, sites. We need new vo models of procuring housing because, uh, I mean, across the continent, self-procurement of housing is 60-70%. Um, in the UK, I think it's about 10%. So we rely a lot of on speculative volume house building, which, of course, has got a role. But is there a bigger role for uh, the public sector, more interventions? You've, I think, Shona Glenn, you've the uh, Land Commission's done some research um, on this area. And might that begin to break the logjam that Craig McLaren was talking about? Yes, I can come in there. Um, yes, I, I think there is a role for, for greater public intervention, definitely. Um, I think there is a risk of jumping to the solutions before you've really understood the problem, though. And um, I, I suppose to go back to what Nicola was saying, I think Nicola was absolutely right to highlight the difference between um, what, you, what you might call um, the development pipeline, um, this sort of developer's development pipeline, which is was absolutely necessary. That's their raw material. If, if developers didn't have a development pipeline of land, they wouldn't be able to build houses. Um, and the, the issue of speculative holding of land. So, so, so those are two very different issues. Um, just to maybe add some context to, I suppose, what Nicola was saying. Um, there was some work done a, a year or two back um, in England, so it's based on England, um, which suggested, it, it looked at this development pipeline and how, how much land you might need, or developers or house builders might need to have in, in order um, to keep the, the development pipeline going at, its, at its, its current volume. And what that found was that in order to keep a, a steady state of production um, in the house building industry, you'd need about uh, 1.25 million planning permissions. And that worked. Um, that that modelling work found that actually there was about a stock of about 0 0.8 million planet permissions. So I actually found a shortfall, which was quite interesting. Um, we're in the process of, of trying to do similar exercise for Scotland at the moment. Um, whether I, I I would be surprised if it showed anything terribly different. Um, the other interesting thing I think that came out of that piece of work was um, the. The, when you looked at the planning permissions and who held the planning permissions, and this, this is for England, um, what it showed was that 55% of those planning permissions, all planning permissions, um, were actually not held by developers, and it was 87% of um, outlying planning permissions weren't held by developers. So I, I think that that starts to tell you something really interesting about who who might be responsible um, for you know speculative land banking, if, that, if that's what you want to call it. Um, so I don't have, I, I don't know what the picture looks like in Scotland because I have research hasn't been done yet, but we we have commissioned it, so, so we're looking at this issue. Um, but I, I, I think there are there are clearly important issues there. About uh, we, we're hearing it anecdotally from um, local authorities, just just the kind of thing that that um, Mr. Whiteman just said. There are stories about. Um, all of the, the potential land that could be available for housing development being held by you know one developer. And um, we're hearing those stories, but what we need to understand is why that's happening, who is holding the land, um, and, and what, what could be done um, to help bring it, bring it forward more quickly. Um, until we've actually answered those questions and understand what, what the issue is, I think it's very difficult to jump to solutions. Okay. You said there as well. Um, the, the Letwood <coughs> review, which was uh, undertaken in, in England uh, last year, I think it was, um, looked at the issue of land banking, banking and, and, and other things and build-out and build out rates and things like that. And I thought the interesting thing for that that came out for me was um, it said that um, you couldn't rely on large-scale um, housing developers uh, to just to solve the housing crisis because they will have they will have land but they won't release it all at the same time they won't build out at the same time because that will have an impact on the prices they can charge because there'll be, there'll be an oversupply um, so we therefore need to have to look at different mechanisms and different models of doing that be it self-build be it using smaller builders as well and um, be it uh, social housing so a much more mixed economy i think is something which would help us to try and make sure that we can take forward um, approaches to try to solve the housing crisis which we have Yes, no, it was interesting that I've got a copy of the Litwin re review here, and it, um, it talked about the 
the build-out rate um, 6.5% uh, down to 3.2%. Uh, um, that raises a, a little bit of a question here because it's often argued that um, the solution to housing affordability, and, and, and in Scotland housing affordability has been um, decreasing, whether it's in the private rented sector or owner-occupied sector, um, we need to build more houses. But if houses are only built at a rate which ensures that the price is maintained at the local market, then prices are not going to come down. So I suppose one of my questions is, would it be good for the economy if the cost of housing, by which I mean the rent people pay in the private rented sector, or the costs that people incur in home ownership, would it be good for the economy if the price of housing came down? We're the, we're the economy committee, so we're interested in impact <laughs> on the economy. Can I make a, a sort of side point to that in that it's not just the, the cost of the housing is a factor of many other costs. And um, a private home bought today will be on a site that the builder has bought from a landowner at a price that the landowner wants to sell it at, has constructed a house which is dictated by the cost of the materials of building that house. But also there's all the extra policy charges that are levied on house building now that perhaps wasn't 20, 30, 40 years ago. So there are develop significant developer contributions for every one of those units to pay for additional infrastructure, um, education contributions, etc., 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 And ultimately, that then has an, an impact on the, the price that one has to pay for the house at the end of the day. So I think if we're looking at it, we have to look at it in the round in terms of the economy and what, what that means. Um, and I think there is... A, there is um, Builders will only build houses that they can sell. It's not part of their building model to not build houses that they, they can't sell. So they'll build in the areas where there is the market that can that, that they can turn their profit um, and they can afford to build there. So there does need to be, as Craig says, more products within the system. The, the fact that the Scottish Government is bringing forward more council housing, again, is very much welcomed. It's something that Scotland is way ahead of the English government on, uh, or Westminster government on, um, and that should help to rebalance. Because if you look at the if you look at the build rates over past number of years, you'll see that there is capacity within the private sector for for building at a rate, and it's fairly it's fairly stable. Okay, it dropped a bit during the sort of uh, the financial crisis, but it's been fairly stable. What's changed is the other actors. Uh, in that system, the SMEs, the local authorities, the social sector. So to bring these guys back into the mix is a very good thing. But there are all sorts of economic reasons that make it difficult for them to come into that mix. So, so one of the things that's contributed to high costs, so when the Office of National Statistics is now publishing data on this, is that the component of a new house um, value that's attributable to the land has increased much, much faster um, than uh, the the bricks and mortar, uh, which have remained relatively stable, as have um, uh, wages, etc. Um, which is one of the reasons why, in countries like Germany and France and Italy, house prices have been much, much more stable. So, looking back, you know, 1940, 1950, 1960, um, land prices were 10 percent, perhaps 20 percent of the cost of a new house. Now they're up to 50 or 60 percent. So, we do do we need to do something about the way the land market operates? And that's coming back to previous questions about public intervention, or Shona mentioned land value capture, etc. That would make sure that we can begin to try and cap some of these costs. Because you talked, Nicola, about um, at a price the landowner is willing to sell at. That's the key point. Yes. And you know some of those prices are astronomical because they are the price that the in, in the market uh, of, with limited planning consents, um, way way above the, the 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 economic value of the land without that consent. So perhaps we can do this through public intervention. We can do it through tax. We could do, and perhaps there is an element of uh, a more robust approach to identifying land as well. Mm -hmm. So if you are identifying in your land supply the supply that is actually deliverable within your local authority, 
rather than just a third of what's deliverable within your local authority, there will be less pressure on the third of the sites that are actually the deliverable ones. Well, on this deliverable, can we, can we, I mean, I'm curious about this deliverable. I mean, I know mm. there are obviously physical constraints to deliverability and sites mm -hmm. shouldn't be in the housing land audit that are not physically capable of being brought forward mm -hmm. because of drainage or, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but you mentioned in your earlier remarks about housing land audit about landowners. And, you know, I have landowners here in Edinburgh who are in, mm -hmm. in the Caribbean who are not selling. And the obvious answer there is to commercially, is to compulsory purchase it. In fact, Edinburgh City Council has done um, some of that. Um, but in terms of, um, I've lost my thread here, um, deliverability, mm -hmm. is there a case, for example, for having auctions of land? Because I think you're implying that it would be the existing volume house builders who would deliver, whereas in fact, lots of people could potentially deliver. There, there is a potential for self-build, small SMEs, other players in the, uh, in the system to come forward. It'd be a very small proportion, I would suggest, um, of the overall um, stock uh, that would come forward in any one year. Um, I think there's been a lot said um, about encouraging more self-build and how that could be part of uh, the solution. And it sounds a very attractive prospect, but given that people buy ready meals because they can't be bothered buying pasta and mince and a tin of tomatoes to make a lasagna, um, it seems inconceivable that there would be a massive volume of people who would be able to buy bricks and mortar and a site and build their own house. People, are ve people have very busy lives and the building of a house is a particularly difficult process and long process. When so we're talking about self-build, we're not really talking about people building their own house. We're talking about self-procurement. We're talking about the client um, driving the process rather than a speculative process where you build them and hope there's a buyer. I mean, people in Austria, 80% are self-procurement. Italy is 63%. France, 60%. Ireland, 56%. Uh, Sweden, 63%. I mean... These people eat ready meals as well, I think. <laughs> I suspect they do, and, and I suspect they I suspect in a lot of other countries there's a different attitude towards home ownership as well, in that it's seen as uh, your house and your home and a place to live. Whereas for a lot of people in this country it's become an investment and it's seen as a speculation. Uh, and that's a I think there's 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 cultural issues potentially in some of this. But I don't think that I mean in a way that all these things can contribute and if people want to self procure and can self procure and can be enabled to, then fantastic. Um, ability to access finance is probably one of the one of the big constraints in that. Um, however, um, I don't know how that potentially solves the problem of forcing landowners who are potentially offshore or whatever, who have no interest in selling to sell, other than through some sort of compulsory purchase scheme. Um, and how you then go through the legal ramifications of, in, of making sure that that land or um, forcing that land to come to market. Um, I think there, is, there are a lot of easy wins and there's a lot of things that are potentially more difficult to achieve. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't try to go for the more difficult, but we need to recognise that it's probably a package of measures that's going to, to help solve some of this problem. Okay. Yeah, it's just um, to make a point, um, I think if you look at the way in which we deal with the housing market in Scotland just now, uh, government, uh, both at a, a national and a local level, are quite passive. Um, they, there, there could be more done to make the market uh, through thinking about things in terms of how you provide your infrastructure, as I've said already, uh, land assembly issues as well, to try and make sure that you can prepare sites and make them viable and, and attractive to different people as well. It happens in the continent, it happens in other places as well, but it's quite a culture change for us to do that. Um, but you can see things happening, um, dare I say, at Homes, Homes England does this sort of work in the past, it prepares sites, it gets things moving. We don't tend to do that anymore, we used to do it in the past, the SDA, Community Scotland and other organisations did things like that. Uh, so that idea of the public sector investing uh, and maybe even taking some of the return out of that investment as well could actually make, have a, a role to play in this process. I just wanted to pick up on one of the comments Mr Whiteman made about the percentage of the purchase price which was now the land value and I have to say I disagree with that. The 60% is not the case. Um, the residual land valuations are the same model that they have been for 20, 30 years for house builders. And it tends to be that the land value paid 
will be around 30%, uh, between 20 and 40% generally, but around 30% of the purchase price. Uh, that's how they calculate it. Um, there are small pockets in Scotland, probably around here in the southeast, where um, it is incredibly competitive to get to get land. So they may push that up slightly, but in order to get your investor to give you the money, you have to be meeting certain hurdles, and that would never get you um, get you the investment you need. The other point I wanted to make is the role of the small builder. Um, Pre-recession, they provided a huge proportion of the homes across Scotland, and they have really struggled to come back. So many of them have retired, have left the industry, never to be seen again. We're working with Scottish Government just now on a, a, a project on encouraging more small builders back into the industry. Some of the fundamental challenges they have is that we're not seeing small sites being allocated anymore. It's actually easier to allocate larger sites, and then our larger members can go in and, and build them out. But we need to have a proportion of sites allocated for small builders so they can get in. But the regulatory process is so much harder now than it was 10 years ago that it's incredibly difficult to get a planning consent. And the upfront cost of getting a planning consent is prohibitive for a small builder, especially if you're looking for finance. And that is their other big problem, is access to development finance if you're a small builder. Um, I think there we have to do a lot, and we are as I say, working with the Scottish Government, looking at that to see whether the Scottish National Investment Bank can help in that regard, and obviously the Building Scotland Fund in advance of that. Um, going back to what Craig's saying about infrastructure, as well, um, given that you're looking at the construction industry in the round, and we often think about infrastructure as being the large-scale projects, the me mega-projects, the Queen's Free Crossing, AWPR, and what have you. But in order to facilitate more house building, it's the granular local level infrastructure that we need. It's the traffic lights at the bottom of the road. It's the extension to the primary school. It's the GP practice. It's all those things which actually stop local communities wanting more housing, because at the moment they see a pressure on all these local bits of infrastructure. But we need to increase those, the capacity of all those things so that it doesn't impact on local communities. Um, that is much harder to deliver um, finding the money for that, procuring that, um, because it is granular and fragmented and split across the country, is not as easy to procure as one big, uh, one big shiny um, you know, kind of infrastructure project, which is maybe gets the press interested, gets uh, you know gets politicians interested. Um, but all these small bits make up communities. That's where you get the extension to the bus route or an extra train station or whatever it is that will then hopefully reduce the amount of um, local community backlash to any new new building that might be happening. Um, Shona Glenn. Okay. I'll try to pick up on a few of the points that have been raised. Um, because I, I, I think what, you, what you're saying about um, custom self-build self is really interesting, but um, I, I also agree with Nicola that there's, it's likely there's going to be need to be a, a package of solutions. There's, there's, there's no silver bullet here, and there's no magic pill, and there's probably lots of different things that we need to do in order to, to fix this problem, um, one of which may, may well be custom self-build. Um, picking up on, I, I suppose, going back to the original question about land value and um, the, the proportion of land value and um, our house prices that's accounted for by land value. Um, the key issue here, I think, uh, we need to understand is what, what's driving that land value. And what's driving it usually is, is hope value. It's, it's the difference between what, what um, the value of land in its, its present use and the value of land in the use that you, you hope it will be, we, will be put. Now, an awful lot of what, what lies behind hope value um, depends on um, what you, what you're expecting, what you expect to have to pay for, um, so if, if if you were buying a house, for example, um, and you were looking at two two identical houses on the same street, and one house had been been owned for the last forty years by by an old lady who who died, and and if you were to move into that house, you'd, you'd maybe need to replace the heating system, you'd need to redecorate, you'd need new carpets and all the rest of it, and you have another house which has has just been renovated completely, um. You're, you're going to look at those houses, and you're, you're going, the value, the, the price that you're going to offer to pay for the for the one that's the old lady's in, is going to be much lower than the price you would offer to pay for the the one that's been renovated. 
Unless, of course, you think there's potential that somebody else might help you with the, the renovation costs. You, you've got a rich auntie or something. Um, if there's a, that uncertainty there, you're going to be less worried about what you pay for the house. And that's that's kind of a, a, a microcosm of what's going on in, in the development industry at the moment. If you're, you're unsure about what it is you might be expected to pay for in terms of, of the school or um, the infrastructure, then that's going to encourage you to, to offer a much, lower, a, a much higher price for the land, um, which leaves much less value there to be captured in the system. So this goes back to the original point that we made earlier about um, having clear and consistent planning policies um, that make it that, that bring that clarity to the system that enable developers to take those planning policies into account when they're deciding on what what price to offer for land. Um, there's some discussion about um, the planning system in the Netherlands and um, and Germany. There's, there's been a lot of people turn to the Netherlands and Germany and point to those countries as examples of how we should do things. And there certainly is a lot we can learn from those countries. But it, it's not a case of just being able to sort of pick and choose bits, bits of those systems and transplant them into Scotland because those countries have very different planning systems to, to what we have here. And the, the key difference is, it's back to this thing about um, they have much more zonal approaches to planning um, in which the public sector takes a much stronger role in, in determining exactly what should happen and where it should happen. So this picks up um, Craig's point about the role of the public sector in planning. And um, I, I think an important point that we haven't drawn out yet is the, the historical context of all this. Um, in the sort of 30 years or so after World War II, when the planning system first came into existence, the public sector took a really, really proactive approach to um, building and delivering large-scale um, infrastructure projects and large, large volumes of housing. In the sort of late 70s, early 80s, the um, change of political philosophy, that all changed, and the public sector really pulled out of that business. And that, that's not really... Well, it, it's not really come back. Um, if we want to deliver the, the kind of the large-scale ambition and housing that this country needs now, that probably needs to change, and the public sector needs to take a much more proactive um, role in the delivery of, of, of housing and, and of, of infrastructure. Um, which brings, and I, I am coming to an end, um, which brings me to my final point, which is one about skills. If, if we do want that much more proactive approach to public sector or public interest-led delivery, as we've been calling it, um, skills are a big part of the problem because over the last 30 years or, or so, um, you, you've had the you know, public sector cuts. A lot of a lot of the skills base in local authority planning departments has been lost, and it, 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 it's just not there anymore. And um, so, if we are going to have the shift to to pu pu more public interest led development, th those skills and that capacity really needs to be built up. And that's not just planning skills; that's also that that's the skills that goes all the way around the planning um, planning. So it's, it's your accountants, it's your your surveyors. It's it's people with finance skills, it's people with knowledge of transport systems and infrastructure, it's, it's that whole package. Um, so I, I guess the, the point is this is a, a much, much bigger, the, the solution to this is much, much bigger than any individual policy, and it, it's a whole package of things. Um, yes, I think as well in a lot of these countries, you mentioned continental con countries, um, there's a large, larger percentage of people who rent for life, will rent a home for life, uh, as compared to Scotland or England, isn't there? So it's, it's a very, it's a different, um, very different setup. Indeed, probably many of these people don't eat ready meals because the, the cultural differences as well. Um, right, uh, John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, I mean, I think building on some of the things that both Jackie Bailey and uh, Andy Whiteman were asking, um, I'm interested in the kind of split between brownfield land and greenfield land because um, we've talked about infrastructure. Well, I've got sites in my constituency in the east end of Glasgow, which are brownfield sites. They've got uh, good bus services running by. They've probably got a railway station nearby. They've got good shops nearby. Um, but the house builders um, are pressurising to get the greenfield land on the edge of the city to the extent that now basically Glasgow and Coke Bridge are going to be running into each other. Uh, where there are, and in these greenfield sites, there are no shops. Uh, there are no schools, there's probably not a, a train station nearby, and there's poor bus services. I mean, how can we force more housing into the brownfield sites and protect the greenfield sites? Nicola Barclay and then <laughs> Fight over it. Um, one thing we do have is the Vacant and Derelict Land Register, which is a useful tool to start with, to start analysing 
why these sites are not coming forward. And we need to look at the, the register over a number of years and let's see whether sites are sitting there forever or whether they're coming in and then going out again. Um, we did a bit of analysis in advance of this, and if we look at urban derelict land, because there's a lot of sites in there which are rural and have all sorts of different issues, such as old, old um, open-cast mines um, in, in very rural areas, but if we look at the urban uh, vacant land, actually in, since 2011 to 2017, there's been a reduction in 19% of that land um, within the register. In Glasgow, it's come down by 29%, and in North Lanarkshire, it's come down by 43%. So we are seeing some of that sites, th those sites um, now being developed, and I actually think that underestimates because when we've mapped some of that, um, that register, we can actually see houses on the ground. So one, we need to make sure that local authorities keep their registers up to date. And I know that there's a vacant and derelict task, vacant and derelict land task force that's been set up, which is a great thing to do. Let's use that task force to really analyse and, and you know, get down to the granular level and look at the sites within your area and, and work out why are they not coming forward. There must be a reason why those sites are not... Is, is it not partly just that there's a fashion that people want to live where there's big old trees nearby? I think people want to live in all sorts of different places at different times in their lives, and different developers will want to build on different types of sites for different parts of the market. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. So should we, as the public sector, just reflect that, or should we be trying to change that? I think, given the shortfall in houses that we have, we're going to need brownfield and greenfield in order to meet the, the need and demand. We've got to look at what are the factors that are stopping those sites coming forward. Is it um, that they're heavily contaminated and so that the cost of remediating is so high that there's no land value at the end of it? Is there a willing seller um, or are they holding out for an aspirational figure that they're never going to get? There's all sorts of reasons. And yeah, I mean, I, I kind of accept there's a balance yeah. in there. It was your first answers to Mr Lindhurst I, I was worried about because it sounded to me like central government will impose on local government, as they appear to be doing in England, that they must have a certain number of houses built. And, and that would, in, as, as far as I understand it, would push, like Glasgow, to allow a lot more building on Greenfield and to, to just leave the brownfield sitting there. So is, is, that, is that what you're arguing for, that a central government should kind of force Glasgow to use up its Greenfield land? No, I think uh, central government needs to ensure that local government does its bit in terms of providing the housing that is needed across the whole country. There will always be a mix of brownfield and greenfield release. Um, our members. But would you that accept that it's likely in Glasgow that if, if your model that you were arguing for at the beginning was imposed, Glasgow, to, if it was forced to provide the numbers, would switch more to greenfield and away from brownfield? I think we need to recognise that brownfield land isn't always attractive to a house builder, and if it's being marketed openly, a house builder is unlikely to be able to bid the highest value. It'll be student residential that will get it, or it'll be hotel use or commercial use. So it's difficult to say to Glasgow, only allocate brownfield land for housing, because unless it can control the sale of that land, unless it's the owner of the land itself, it can't decide who eventually will build on it. Or unless it has a, a clear allocation that this must be a residential only site. Most brownfield sites aren't allocated. They're windfall sites and it goes to the highest bidder for whatever use they think they can get planning consent. Okay, for. well maybe I can bring some others in at this point. I mean, Glasgow has had some success by except it has been with subsidy. For example, the Commonwealth Games Village was heavily contaminated. Uh, but now we've got good quality housing in there and that, and that has changed perceptions that actually you can have a nice house in the east end of Glasgow. I think that's a very fair point. Um, I think without the Commonwealth Games, the attractiveness of that part of Glasgow City would never have been considered by a lot of people who currently live there. Um, and that has shown what public sector intervention to bring forward some of these more difficult sites in locations where um, there's um, the council's desire or the public sector desire to, to have this development happen. Um, I think a lot of the brownfield sites are very difficult to bring forward and they bring their own costs with them. You know, in a city centre location, if you're having to go up higher than four storeys, you need to build in the, 
the uh, cost of lifts and all this sort of thing as well. The, the working of the site is difficult because it's within a, a working city. How you arrange, you know, how you service it in terms of bins, all these things become difficult, but they're not insurmountable. But also, I think we have to think about, I think we have to think about product. And I think we have to think about what is built on these sites as well. What will make these sites attractive to a broader um, market? Um, in Scotland, we're very lucky in that we have a culture of living in big flats in cities. Glasgow West End, very, very popular still with all sorts of segments of the community. Edinburgh, similarly so. In England, that's not the case. In England, there is no tradition of that. So the tradition in England is everybody wants a, a cottage with roses over the door. That's, you know, everybody wants a detached house with the garage. That's not the case in Scotland. So you're pushing against an open door in terms of urban living, but you have to produce a product and you have to be able to build that product that people are going to want to invest in. So if you're building small one bedroom flats, then families are not going to move into them. If you want families to live in the east end of Glasgow, then it needs to be a product that families can actually live in. It needs to have access to schools and all that sort of thing. So there needs to be, I would suggest there needs to be intervention probably to enable that to happen. It but won't happen would, on its Could own. one of the interventions being further restricting building on greenfield land so that relatively speaking, brownfield had an advantage? Can I give you an example from Newcastle? Newcastle City is fairly dense, fairly tight boundary around it. Number of local authorities down the Tyne Valley, out towards the coast, attractive suburban locations, if you like. Newcastle City had restrictive policy in terms of the building of houses for a number of years, where uh, we had a policy that for every house that you built up at the Great Park, which was a, a greenfield site, a house had to be built within a regeneration area. Policy failed massively because what happened was it just constrained development uh, on the edge of the city because the properties couldn't be built in the, the weaker market, more urban areas, um, and be sold. So they just weren't. So what happened was the builders, the investors, went to North Tyneside, went down the Tyne Valley and built houses everywhere except in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. The problem we then had in Newcastle when... Um, I took the job as head of planning policy was we had a massive declining working age population. We had a huge legacy problem that had been brought about by that policy because basically just nobody was building there. And with the scrapping of regeneration monies that made it even more difficult. Um, it wasn't so difficult to travel into Newcastle from almost anywhere, therefore people were choosing to move out. We were losing a thousand people a year from the city and they were all working age people. They were taking the disposable income with them. So, Our so I can interrupt you. That, 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 so. I mean, I, I recognise some of that with Glasgow as well. I mean, mm. that suggests that a council had, does not have the power itself to protect its green belt or green land, that it would have to be a more national policy. So in Glasgow's case, the, the government would have to restrict East Renfrewshire, East Dumbartonshire and some of these as to how much uh, building they could build in competition with Glasgow. I think there is a very, very tricky balance to be struck uh, in terms of policies like that, um, and I think you can probably you can probably change people's attitudes towards urban living in the east end of Glasgow over time or on a big scale like at the Com Commonwealth Village. Um, but I think you would need to be very careful about very restrictive policies that meant that people just chose not to live in Glasgow. Now it's not just people choosing not to live in Glasgow; it's it's businesses choosing not to invest in Glasgow as a result. If you're bringing inward investment in. Um, tech companies, whatever, they're coming in, they are looking at what your skills are within the area and they're looking at where their people are going to live. If you as a city cannot offer a full package, they will not invest in your city. They'll go to somebody else's city who is able to provide that whole package. So I think there is a lot of unintended consequences that we need to be careful of when we're talking about strategic planning and we need to try and balance all of those things. Okay, that's fair. I mean, I get the point. Okay, right, thanks very much. Well, um, well, maybe briefly, Mr McLaren, because... Just like touch quickly, I think we absolutely should prioritise brownfield land. Uh, it doesn't mean that everything we built on brownfield land, there will still be a need for greenfield releases, absolutely. Um, but um, if we want to do that, we need, we need money, we need to invest in it. It's as simple as that. Um, the Vacant and Derrick Land Fund, as stands just now, is something like £9.4 million, pounds, which won't... Re make sure that many of the sites are actually going to be um, brought into productive use so there's a need to try and think about how we do that um, 
I think the other thing we need to remember as well is that um, there's different reasons why, play, why different bits of land actually are brownfield. It may be because they need remediation, um, the accessibility issues. We need to look at them individually. It's not just a one big stick approach to it as well. Um, and we've also we've done the easiest ones. It's just now, so it's going to get harder and harder as time goes on. Uh, we've picked the easy ones off, the, lo the low-hanging fruit, for obvious reasons. So if we're, we're serious about this, we need to think about how we, how we invest in it as well. The other thing is um, my reading of the stats are a wee bit different from Nicola's. What I, I can see is the, um, the, number of, uh, the, the number of hectares of vacant and derelict land in Scotland between 2011 and 2017 actually went up by 2 per cent in, in, my, in my reading of the, the statistics as well. Um, a big, chat, big part of that's minerals and out in the countryside, so that's in some ways a different issue. It's still an important issue, but a different issue. But the other thing about those stats, last year um, we actually had over 200 hectares of new brownfield um, vacant and derelict land come on as well. So there's a bit about trying to make sure we don't get to that stage uh, in the first instance and try and stop things from coming, becoming uh, vacant or derelict. Thank you. Well, I, well, I think probably I think we've had long enough because my colleagues are wanting to come in with questions. Yeah, I, I think Sean Grin did want to come in sure, perhaps sure. briefly and then we'll come on to Colin Beattie. I, I, okay, just briefly, um, because the Vacant Dairy Land Task Force was, was mentioned, which is an initiative we were leading on, um, I think the whole question of whether whether part of the whether whether the public interest might be served um, by restricting development on on greenfield sites is really interesting one because I, I I can see why you might want to do it for for public interest reasons but Nicola's quite right in what she's saying you would need to be very very careful in how you did that because the the choice that that people might make developers might make people might make and um, might not be and um, oh I can't I can't develop on the, the greenfield site they're all therefore I'll develop on the brownfield site it might well be I can't develop on the greenfield site there therefore I'll Go, go away and uh, look elsewhere. So I, I think you, you, you do need to be really careful with that. I'm not saying it's not part of the part of the package, but you do need, need to be careful. Um, the issue about vacant and derelict land, I think, is it, 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 we need to turn this whole issue on its head a bit, I think. Um, we've been looking a lot at vacant and derelict land recently, and one of the issues we're, we're finding is vacant and derelict land is not this, this one package of, of land. It's not all the same. It's all sorts of different types of land in there. Some of it might be suitable for housing, but it, it won't all be. So there's a, a very a very real need to understand what is in that bucket called vacant and derelict land. And that's part of the work that we're, we're starting to do just now. Um, but the the change in the mindset, I think, is really interesting because what we focused a lot about on, on sticks, but actually we need to think about the, the carrots, I think, um, and start changing the attitude to vacant, to, to vacant brownfield land um, to make that more of an opportunity. So actually people people want to go and develop there. Um, the way you do that, I think, you, you, house builders are, are, are in it to make money. You know, They're not going to go to places where they can't make money. But if the public sector were to take in, take a more interventionist approach, a more this public interest-led approach to development, and actually make it attractive, make these propositions attractive to the development industry, then that might might very well start to change the way that we look at brownfield sites. So it is actually a very big opportunity for Scotland, I think, but it is one that does need to be grasped at very, uh, you know, at, at the top level of government. Thanks very much, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Peter. Let me just follow on actually from what Shona Glenn was saying there about uh, intervention. How could the public sector actually intervene to improve the operation of the housing land market? Should it? It appears from what people are saying they should, but sh maybe ask the question, should they? Do you want me to pick up there? Um, it goes back to this, this issue of public interest-led development. Um, we, we've done some work on this uh, last year, public interest-led development. What, what I mean by that is where a public agency takes a, a real proactive role in initiating and, and driving forward development and that, that's just not something that happens very often um, in, in Scotland anymore. But how would you envisage that working? Um, well Dundee for example, Dundee City, um, Dundee Waterfront is a, is a good place to look at because they, they are the, I suppose the one place in Scotland where this approach has has been delivered and has worked um, and we, there are a number of, number of reasons why that's been successful and I think we probably need to understand more about um, why that is but I think a lot of it comes down to leadership. You've got um, a couple of very high-profile individuals who've kind of driven that process forward. You've got political support um, that hasn't really changed over over a number of decades. Um, 
you've got a, a planning authority where all of the skills needed, so it's, it's not just planning skills, but all of the skills needed to, to deliver um, a, a complicated um, major development are, are in the same place at the same time. So it's, it's a, you know, accountants, finance skills, procurement skills, planning skills, economists, um, charter spheres, everybody, they're all, they're all there. And that package of skills doesn't, it's very rare now, I think, for, for that package of skills to exist within planning authorities because of the because of the kind of ongoing cuts that have happened over over a series of decades so if, if we do want to move, make that move to a, a more interventionist approach and um, public public interest-led development and um, which we've been advocating then what we need to invest in is are those skills now there's a number of ways of doing that you, you might want to invest in in local authorities themselves and in the, in the planning departments um, one suggestion that's been made by a number of a number of agencies, which I, I, I think probably has a lot of merit, um, is either creating a, a new public agency or perhaps giving the remit to an existing agency um, to pull together all those skills, so as those skills can be deployed to to large sites around the country. Let me just follow on from that because you've described the infrastructure that has to be in place uh, across the public sector in order to support this. What actual intervention are you talking about? What did they, uh, other, other, other than beefing up their planning department and having the, have, uh, given the proper support there, what did they actually intervene to do? What made the difference? Um, okay. <laughs> um, so they, they went in and actually assembled the sites. So, so they, I, I think a lot of the sites were already in public ownership, but where, where they weren't, they used CPO powers um, to acquire the sites. They, they put the infrastructure um, in on the ground, so, so they, they cleared the sites, put the infrastructure into the sites to make them developable. Um, and then they actually went out and marketed the, marketed the sites um, and, and brought in private investment for, for people to build hotels or, or um, and build, build housing or, or, or whatever kind of development it was. So it was that whole... They, they took lead on that whole process, right from assembling the site right, right through to, to marketing, the, marketing it for development. And others may, may know more about the, the detail than I, I, I do. I take more of what you're saying there, and this is a, a, a commercial site that's been developed. How would that, that sort of interventionism work in what you've described as the retail housing market? Well, it, it would be exactly that, I think. It would be the public sector. Same model. It's, same model, yeah. But it, it, it's... I think in this there's a, there's a temptation always, and I, I understand it, for people to, to sort of want the big bang solution, I, and I, I, I don't think it exists, um, but I, I think, and it's, it sort of sounds a bit dull in a way, and the, the answer we're proposing is public interest-led development and it's everybody working together, but I, actually um, history has demonstrated that that's, that can be very, very effective, but it, it does need to be driven um, by leadership from the top and, and properly resourced. We could look at Homes England and what they're doing, and it's a fairly recent reincarnation, but they are seeing huge success. They are acting in various ways. They're financing small builders, they're financing medium-sized builders, they're developing themselves, they're procuring land, assembling it, master planning it, um, they're partnering with the private sector, and they're acting as a facilitator, and they are the go-to body. And we just don't have an equivalent in Scotland, where you have somebody and their entire remit is measured on the number of homes actually delivered on the ground. And that's fundamentally different than a local authority, which is make sure you have allocated enough houses in a plan, and as we would call them paper houses, but they're not actually being measured on the number of keys handed over to a tenant or an owner at the end of the day. And I think that's what we need is something. And I, I agree with Shona, actually, that we do need either local authorities to be um, invested in so they can do that job themselves or we get one agency uh, in Scotland to lead it. What is the best approach? <sighs> That's not my call. <laughs> You've got an opinion. Yeah, is it well, best no, to have a centralised one or is it best to have it at local authority level? I think given we've got the city regions, you would maybe have one um, agency that's focusing on those, but we have such a diverse country uh, and the rural areas need a very different solution, I would suggest. So it may be a bit of both. You have um, the city regions beefed up into doing more of that interventionist approach there where you're going to get much more investment and you can collect it and use it better. The rural economy has a whole different set of challenges which probably need a slightly different approach. Okay. 
So the, other, the other thing that's interesting about Homes England is that they're now asset rich in the, all the public sector land that was in different pots, whether it was former schools or former hospitals or old power stations or whatever, that land has now is part of their portfolio and they have a remit to bring that forward uh, and to work with the private sector um, to uh, to deliver those homes, as Nicola says. Um, I'm working on a site in Newcastle at the moment, which is a Homes England site, which was a, um, gosh, an RDA site before that. It was an English estate site before that, and it was originally an industry, an industry site. It didn't come forward for industry. It's now being promoted for housing. We're master planning it. We're getting the planning consents for it, uh, and then it will go out to the private market, to the house builders, to bid for pockets of that land to bring forward for market housing. So it, it's an agency that's, that has assets and land and has a remit to, to drive that forward as well. I'd like to ask a question just on something a wee bit different but connected. Um, what are your views on the ability of the, of the sector to meet Scotland's infrastructure needs uh, and to drive the growth as per the investment strand of Scotland's uh, economic strategy and carrying on from that? deliver the 50,000 homes that uh, we're aspiring to by 2021. I should say a previous evidence session um, gave some comments on that which were a little bit negative, but I'd be interested to hear what you say. In terms of the <coughs> house building industry or in terms of the construction, construction industry? Construction. Because I think if you're looking to the construction industry, then that's obviously a much broader uh, piece. I think um, a lot of um, emphasis has been put on the house building industry delivering quite a lot uh, in terms of schools, road junctions, um, cemeteries, parks. You know, the amount of contributions that are, that are requested from house building are significantly more potentially than they are from the commercial sectors. And sometimes that's because of the locations they're developing in um, and the, the perceived needs that are generated as part of that industry. I think if you're relying on the house building industry to provide um, new social infrastructure, then it will fail because I don't think there's enough money in the kitty to allow that to happen. It will drive up prices, it will make uh, development unaffordable and it just won't happen. Um, I think there needs to be a package of interventions there. Uh, that enables um, everybody within the district to be able to contribute to um, the infrastructure that's required in that district, not necessarily just um, trying to rely on big packets of money coming from, from house builders where it just it just will just render the, the sites unviable. One factor which hasn't been uh, talked about much is the availability of skilled labour. Is that is that going to have a significant impact? I think there's a bit to differentiate between labour and almost sort of professional and managerial stuff coming from the, the town planning profession. Um, we, we've seen a, 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 a big loss in planning staff and local authorities uh, in the last since 2009-10. We've seen a 25% uh, loss in planning staff, for example. Uh, it's taken £40 million out of the planning budgets. Um, and it's the, most, it's the biggest uh, affected uh, planning as, as local government service uh, as well. So there's, there's, it's not just about brickies, although they are important. We need to remember that if you if you do not have planning officers there to process planning applications, to put in place development plans, you won't have housing permissions. You won't have houses built on the ground. Your town centres won't be planned as good as they can as well. So we need to we need to bear in mind there's that there's that side to the the staffing element as well. I. I I know it's, a, it's quite a difficult job sometimes to sell planning to people because it's got a certain reputation, um, but it's a really, really important thing. Um, I hopefully try to demonstrate that this morning. Um, but for me, it's interesting. We have a lot of initiatives, for example, on STEM, on teachers, and how we need them to try and make sure society and the, and the economy works to, to best effect. For me, there's a bit of think about planners on that route as well. Should we not be having a campaign to make sure we can get people into the, to, to the profession as a career, which can actually help them to deliver things which include uh, a better economy for people as well. We've seen uh, in the planning profession, um, I say a, a loss in staff, but also it's becoming, um, uh, we're getting less and less graduates coming in. There's about 100 graduate planning graduates a year in Scotland, and not all of them will stay in Scotland. Um, so there's a need to try and invest in planning and other professions as well, which provide that, that, that glue or um, provide that, that journey to try and make sure we can get construction actually delivered on the ground come back on your 50,000 homes point, you were asking whether we thought it would be delivered. And obviously it's 50,000 affordable 
35,000 of which are social rent, so a lot of them rely on public funding, which uh, Scottish Government have put into it. Um, I think there is a fair chance that we'll get close to that target. Um, I know a lot of RSLs and private house builders are working incredibly hard to get those houses built. It's not helped by planning committees at a local level rejecting sites at committee, even with officer recommendation and funding in place. So the message from Scottish Government of wanting to deliver these 50,000 affordable homes is not always filtering down to those local planning committees. There's still resistance at a local level to any housing, regardless of the tenure. So if we don't reach the 50,000, it won't be for a lack of trying. I definitely think there's a, there's a really strong push from the wider industry to, to get them built. It's interesting that you're focusing on the planning side. Uh, previous panels have focused on skill shortages within the construction industry in general. Um, you've not touched on that at all. Houses are being built. Um, skills are a challenge, um, but they're not the, the most important challenge. I think if we can get planning consents through and we can see there's a pipeline of work, that's when you encourage apprentices, that's when you can staff up, that's when you can bring people in. It's the lack of certainty that you've got that, that pipeline of work ahead, which I think stops people coming into the industry and staying in the industry. But you believe that there are uh, resources available out there in the right circumstances to bring in? It's a challenge. I, I definitely would say it's a challenge, and I know our, our members fight for brickies, and squads will go from one developer to another, um, and it's really hard, and more and more of them are bringing them in-house and recruiting them as, as staff rather than having them as subcontractors, and that's their way of protecting their, their labour resource. Um, so they will be creative, um, and you know there's some use of off-site manufacturing to try to help with the skill shortage. That's not going to be the, the golden ticket, but it's one way of looking at whether we can um, you know, alter the system to make it more efficient House builders are resilient and they will find solutions if they can see that, that you know, they've got an opportunity to deliver, but it's all about that certainty of pipeline which will allow them to invest longer term in training and upskilling. And A lot of them do work with um, ex-armed forces and bringing them in and retraining them, so there are, there are ways of getting people into the industry, not just the young apprentice, which is the obvious thought, um, but they need certainty of, of pipeline to put that investment in point for raising um, the issue about uh, planning was, was just because we read a lot about the construction side of things um, and that's where the, the spotlight tends to get shown on, on brickies and people like that and, and right so there's, there's, a, there's an issue there we need to do it but I do often worry that the some more professional side of things gets overlooked and they are as important to that process as well so we need to put in place procedures processes support to make sure we have those professionals not just planners building control officers and others as well because we need them to go through the process to make sure we get things done as well so we should be looking at apprenticeship schemes for for, for planners and building control officers we should be looking at for, for in different professional settings uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning to the panel. I'm going to cheer you all up by asking you um, your thoughts on Brexit and whether or not you have any uh, concerns. Um, but before I ask you specifically about any concerns uh, which you, you may have, um, I just picking up on some earlier themes. Um, I just wondered if the panel could comment on that, given that there is um, a, a generalised concern around uncertainty and Brexit, that whether it was welcome that um, across a range of initiatives, the Scottish Government has given uh, certainty uh, and continuity, for example, uh, on funding around uh, affordable housing, and, and Nicola Woodward mentioned uh, earlier uh, that in terms of per head of the population, Scotland is uh, outperforming uh, England and Wales uh, substantially uh, on delivering uh, affordable uh, housing. I'm also conscious that there's a help to buy scheme um, you know, there's a significant amount of money, um, you know, put into that. I think uh, around £100 million, pounds, you know, very much taken across a 10-year approach. And given my uh, West Lothian uh, connections, uh, I'm aware of initiatives such as the Winchborough development, 
which is a massive development, you know, nearly three and a half thousand homes. But that required Scottish government, local government developers to work very closely together uh, to overcome uh, some of the infrastructure and blockages uh, issues as well. So just in the context of the Brexit uncertainty, um, if the panel could talk about, you know, some of the initiatives that are at least um, attempting to provide uh, some certainty of investment and for the industry, whether that's construction or, or, or house builders. And I don't mind who starts. I've got a very brief point, I suppose, to make on this. Um, we've got eight offices across the UK, uh, in Edinburgh here and then uh, in London and across, across the rest of England um, and in Wales. And I think as a practice, we are noticing um, a, ma a major difference and in investor confidence in the southeast of England. The, the London market uh, is quite twitchy um, and it's the, the willingness of investors to, um, to make decisions at this time is really uh, starting to bite and probably has for the last six months to a year. We're seeing it less in our regional offices um, and certainly I, we're not seeing it significantly in Scotland and I think uh, Nicola will probably back that up. Um, but it is a worry in terms of investment in the system, I would suggest, and finance coming into the system um, and just that whole level of uncertainty, um, particularly where you have cities that uh, rely on multinational companies perhaps. So, I mean, that's, you, you, you're specifically talking about the uncertainty uh, with re respect to, to, to Brexit. I just want to be clear uh, for, for, for the record there. Um, Nicola, um, Barclay, do you have, um, you'll have, I, I'm sure you'll have uh, welcomed, you know, help to buy, etc. on those uh, uh, initiatives. Impact of Brexit, firstly, um, it's most likely going to be felt through a lack of confidence, um, consumer confidence. Will people feel um, secure enough in their job to go and get a, m a mortgage. Interestingly, January just, this January just passed, has been one of the strongest starts to the year for house sales that we've seen in a long time. So there's certainly in Scotland, we're not seeing that um, lack of confidence that we, we were kind of expecting to see in a way. And I think in a way, because we have such pent up demand, um, you know, interest rates are still low, people can still get mortgages, unemployment is historically low. People still need to move house, buy houses, they're still getting married, having children, and all the normal things, um, that they are still buying houses. So we're not seeing any issues at the purchase end of the pipeline of, of the process, as it were. Um, I have no evidence to, to back this up, but I would assume that house builders will be looking at their land deals, which are coming up certainly over the next few weeks, and wondering whether or not to go ahead. Let's see what happens in March, um, because that's it's really beginning to get to crunch time. Um, but as I say, the market still remains strong. So, you know, we're still seeing, certainly in the strong market areas, people bidding hard for sites. Um, Developers, obviously, the larger ones are preparing for Brexit. There's stockpiling going on of certain building materials that can be stockpiled. Things like timber you can't really do, so um, we may have some challenges with that. But talking about the interventions from Scottish Government, Helped By obviously has been very welcomed over the years. It has allowed, um, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, numbers of people who have been able to access home ownership through that. I do think the scheme in Scotland is much better than the one in England, and it's interesting to see that the one in England is now being refined, um, bringing down the headline prices and targeting those who need it most. Um, I think the way it's been targeted in Scotland has worked very, very well, um, and we just you know, need to look and, and see what happens in the future with it, but that's a, maybe a conversation for another day. The Building Scotland Fund that's been used at Winchborough has been, again, very welcomed. Um, I've been monitoring very closely mm -hmm. to see who is um, applying for the funding and how quickly they're getting results. And it seems to be working very well in advance of the Scottish National Investment Bank, which again, we welcome. So I think the government is, is right in these interventions to keep the market going. Um, the, the outfall of Brexit could trump it all. We just don't, none of us know what's going to happen, unfortunately, but business as usual at the moment. 
-hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shona Glenn? I probably don't have an awful lot okay. I can add to that. Um, I, the, the individual schemes are a bit outside my area of ex yeah. expertise, okay, no but um, on the point about Brexit, I ho hopefully business as normal will continue, as Nicholas, as Nicholas described. Um, if it doesn't, um, what, surely that's even, an even more of an opportunity for the public sector to, to step in with this kind of proactive approach to, to leading development that, that we've been talking about. Okay, thank you. Uh, Craig McLaren, do you have yeah. anything to add? Yeah, there's, uh, there's five things we've set out, which are the uncertainties. We're still not quite sure as what the outcomes are going to be, so the things we're worried about. Um, one is the whole idea of, of workforce, of people mm. and, and, and talent, and um, if we're going to still be able to attract um, planners from out with uh, the UK uh, in the future and what impact that will have uh, on that. Uh, and also, in terms of student numbers, uh, what if that have an impact as well, and if that has an impact on the viability of uh, planning degree courses as well? So, because a lot of our, our courses rely quite heavily on uh, foreign, st foreign students at the moment. There's so a thing as well about standards um, and what the future, for example, environmental standards are going to be, and if there's going to be consistency across the UK on those as well, and then could it be a competition? Um, so we're, we're still waiting to see what happens with that. There's an issue with trade, uh, just selling, planning services um, outside of uh, the UK. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a business like that. We can do it. We do stuff across the world. So what impact will there be on that as well? The issue of investment, which has already been rehearsed around the table. Um, uh, but also, I like that. Uh, I'm not sure if there's going to be an issue of the cost of materials. We're hearing different um, different work on that's going on, which is saying that it could have an impact, uh, which therefore could have an impact on viability, which goes back to the things we've been talking about already as well. And the fourth area we've got is, is, is about research. And it sounds a wee bit peripheral, but it actually can be incredibly important because a lot of this research is set up to help you to provide innovation. Um, and if we can't do much of this uh, pan-European research anymore, that could create a big hole uh, of, um, of ideas, of thinking, of, new, of uh, new ways of doing things, which we'd probably need. Thank you. I, I wanted to pick up on some of the uh, specific Brexit concerns around skilled labour and imports to give the rest of the panel an opportunity to, to talk specifically about, about those issues. Um, I mean, committee has been advised that um, the industry imports uh, up to 62% of its uh, building materials and components uh, to the tune of £5.7 billion uh, from um, the EU. There are over 7,000 construct construction workers in Scotland coming from the EU. We've previously heard concerns about uh, perhaps a drain on uh, the workforce in Scotland um, if EU nationals um, in London leave. You know, there could be a bit of uh, an, an effect there. Um, and I'd also be interested to hear the panel's views on uh, issues around freedom of movement and the UK government's immigration uh, bill and white paper, and specifically um, the uh, extension of the Tier 2 30,000 uh, minimum salary threshold. Um, and again, I don't know, Nicola, do you, would you like to start on that? Um, cost of materials coming in is increasingly a concern and I think it's the you know the fluctuations in the exchange rate obviously brought on by Brexit uncertainty so it is still a Brexit related issue um, we do rely heavily on imported materials as I mentioned timber is one of the few that you can't stockpile um, unfortunately the timber we grow in Scotland is not suitable for timber kits it grows too quickly um, so you need Finnish or Siberian <coughs> timber which grows slower and then it is denser and it has the right properties we need for the timber kits that we use predominantly in Scotland and less so in England. So that's something that um, I know our members will be keeping a close eye on. Um, skills in terms of the European labour force, um, I think it was Barrett did a nationwide survey of all their, um, their tradesmen and as you came up the country, it was fewer and fewer. I think it was maybe 80% in the southeast of England, and it's less than 10% in, in the north of Scotland. So although we don't have a heavy reliance on them, we need every single person we can get on site. So if, if they leave, um, and as you say, if there's a bit of a drain down into the southeast, things like HS2, um, there may be concerns. Although I think we have to remember that construction employees who are building say, for example, AWPR, are the different skill set to those building on 
house building sites. So it's not necessarily the same people. Mm -hmm. Those guys who built the Queen's Free Crossing will not be then going to work for Barrett round the corner. They'll be off doing another big construction project. Um, so I think for, for skills for me, it's the homegrown talent, keeping guys, we have an ageing workforce, um, and, and guys on site will retire, you know, probably earlier than, than 60 because it's tough on site, it's, it's hard manual labour, so we've got to make sure we've got younger people coming through. But Craig's right, we've got to look at the professional services as well, um, and I think it's often <coughs> forgotten about, but if we don't have the people in the offices, whether it's in the local planning office or building control, or sitting in a house builder's office, doing the designs, doing the cost control, all of that, the whole system grounds to halt. So we need to have skills coming into the entire industry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and selling the entire industry is a really good place to come and work. And on the diversity agenda, it definitely is a really good place to work. There's a lot of women in the house building now, um, which is great to see far more than when I started out. And it, it's, it's a very rewarding career. We're not very good at selling it. And that's something that's a task on my shoulders rather than yours. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Shona? Hi. Yeah, sorry. I'm just noticing time. We're, um, we're, we've actually gone over our time quite a bit. So perhaps if we could um, try and... Uh, um, tr I'm try say try I and be... <laughs> Perhaps be, be it's brief. quite difficult to be brief about Brexit, but um, well, I'm sure I, I was actually only going to say I don't think best. I have anything to add there. So, sorry, no. I, I was only going to say I don't think I have anything to add on that specific yeah. construction skills. So, well, if others do have something to add, briefly. The thing I would add was just to echo what I said earlier on about uh, that it's just the uncertainty is still there, um, and we just need some certainty. Uh, that's the key for us around those five issues which I, I discussed. I think, and from uh, from our perspective as a company, um, we do have a lot of uh, European nationals who work for us uh, in our offices. We've got a couple of hundred employees, so you can imagine there's quite a proportion that have come from uh, outside the UK. And recruiting graduates, as Craig's mentioned, is becoming more and more difficult. Um, and I'm sure that will continue to be the, be the case. Uh, we only work within the UK, though, so our um, our business model doesn't get broken in terms of working abroad. Um, but that's not to say that there won't be capacity issues um, to be able to support the development industry to bring forward projects. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. I wonder if I could um, go back to, you, back to the very beginning when some of your opening remarks when you were talking about differences in planning policy between Scotland and England. And I think both Nicholas were chatting about this, but I picked up um, viability, deliverability, no carrot and stick needs to be deliverable uh, in the English model. And I'm thinking about a local example in East Ayrshire, where, where sadly uh, we, we recently turned down a major um, application which had a, a thousand houses as part of that plan. It was connected with a whole load of leisure elements too, but the, the tests that were applied to that seemed to me to be incredibly rigorous. And there was a a viability test applied to that and Scottish ministers ultimately turned it down. So could you just explain to me what you meant by the difference in the application of viability testing perhaps? Because it seemed to me to be pretty well robust here. Okay, I so um, I was talking about applying viability testing initially at the policy making point um, to ensure that um, the policy... So what happens in England, you must ensure that your policies aren't overly onerous, that would prevent development from happening. Um, and you have to test that and you have to make sure that um, that you aren't putting in place any measures that, that would that would make that would just mean that the development wouldn't come forward. Um, you also have to test uh, all the sites that you're allocating. I don't know the specifics of uh, the one you're talking about, but um, a large mixed use scheme, if you were allocating that within your local plan south of the border, you would need to test what the um, the infrastructure capacity was in the local area and whether or not it was affordable to increase that if that was a requirement, whether that was roads or bus services or whatever, um, local schools, could they be extended, was there already capacity in the area, all those sort of things. Um, infrastructure in terms of water resources and electricity, all those sort of things as well. So you would need to um, test the viability of uh, that development and so that you had certainty that when you were putting it in your plan that it had a chance of coming forward, uh, particularly if you were relying on it to deliver your housing needs, your economic needs or any of these sort of things. So, And that then gets tested 
in England by the Planning Inspectorate, the equivalent of the reporters unit here, um, to make sure that what you're proposing is uh, sound. So is it justified and is it evidenced um, in order to bring it forward? And that's a fairly rigorous testing. Um, and the hope is that that will ensure that what has been promoted through the plans, there is certainty that it's going to come forward. And if funding is required, then you would need to identify where that funding would come from, what the factors are that would need to bring that into play. Um, I think if you don't have that rigorous level of testing, the uncertainty about those developments becomes um, much more apparent. Um, and while uh, you may have a lot of very interesting projects within your local plan, if none of them are delivering, then you're really doing a disservice to your local community. Um, and also the ability to um, you know, deliver the economic ambitions of not just you know, sort of your local authority area, but in Scotland's case, the whole of Scotland. I think I can say from knowledge that those rigorous tests were applied and the, the wider issues that I think Craig focused on too, about infrastructure, about schooling, about drainage and access and all of that, that, that was all taken into account. So are you saying, Nicola, that the developers in their initial submissions should should have to say, have to, have to um, demonstrate that they can meet these criteria or is it ultimately for the reporter to ultimately say, sorry, you didn't? Where, uh, where sites are being promoted, big strategic sites are being promoted by a particular landowner or a consortium, consortium of developers, it is quite normal for uh, quite substantial evidence to be prepared by the developer, the landowner, to ensure that their allocation is seen to be sound and evidenced and justified. Uh, that's entirely normal. I guess the frustration with the system in England, and one that we would probably want to guard against in Scotland, is that you spend, as a developer, you spend a significant amount of money up front in order to justify your development. But it doesn't necessarily give you an easy ride through the planning process when you then put in your planning application. And it is not unusual for uh, some sites to then be refused at committee, which sort of flies in the face of having to go through that process in the first place. You know, it's been consulted on widely, it's been through an examination, it's been looked at by an independent uh, reporter, inspector, um, and, you know, it has been deemed to be an acceptable location for, in terms of all the tests. As long as you're bringing forward a development in line with the policy, then it would be reasonable to expect you to get a planning consent on the back of that. That doesn't always happen, and that's where significant frustration still exists, perhaps, within the system. Okay. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much to all of our guests for coming in to speak to the committee today. I'll now move on to, well, I'll suspend briefly to allow you to um, leave before we move on to the next item on our agenda. Thank you very much. is the Electronic Invoicing Public Contracts Etc. Amendment Scotland Regulations 2019. This is a Scottish statutory instrument. Does any member have any substantive issues they wish to raise or are they content that the instrument comes into force? Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. In that event, I will suspend the meeting and move to private session. <coughs>